This Nook size PC has a 16 core processor. Inside, there is room for up to 96 gigabytes of memory, two SSDs, it has Wi Fi, dual 2.5 gig Ethernet, and can even support Thunderbolt devices. And in this generation, we get an onboard NPU for AI inference. These mini PCs have come a long way since they were small and underpowered, so, well, let's get to it. Hey guys. This is Patrick from STH, and this is the ASRock Industrial Nookbox 155H. Frankly, it doesn't really look like your average industrial PC that's designed for passive cooling and all that kind of stuff, but what it is, is ASRock Industrial's take at a Nook. And that 155H means that this has an Intel Core Ultra 7 Series processor, which the model number is 155H. But as far as this little box is concerned, this is one of the first generations that really has something new in a long time. Now, before we get too far, I just want to point out that ASRock Industrial did send this unit for review, and we're going to go over this whole thing really quickly here. They did not get to see this video, or we don't have to have a script anyway, so they couldn't see that before we went live with this. So we get to do our editorially independent process. We just got this before it was released publicly. Hopefully, it'll be hitting shelves sometime around when we publish this video. And while they sent the bare bones unit, we did have to go populate this with all of the kind of cool stuff that you're going to see. And for that, I just want to say thank you to all the STH YouTube members who make that possible. Your subscriptions allow us to buy all the components inside. So if you do want to join and become a member of this channel so you can support us, so we can go buy stuff to put in these boxes, that would be awesome. And you can join down below. With that, let's get to the hardware. Okay, so first off, uh, this is just your standard 4x4 Nook form factor. So it's a little bit bigger than 4x4 by uh, almost two inches tall. But the overall chassis design we've seen many times before. Looking at the front, though, is where we start to see some features. So first, we have a power button, which we always need that. And then we have a USB Type A port. This is a USB 3.2 Gen 2 port, so it is a 10 gigabit per second port. On the subject of USB, you're going to see that we have two more USB Type C ports. And uh, those are super interesting and I wish that ASRock Industrial did a better job of labeling them. And so how it works is that the one that's in the middle is a USB 4, but also a Thunderbolt 4 port that has DisplayPort as an alt mode output. I think it's like DisplayPort 2.1. And so that's one of your highest speed display outputs. Now, the Type-C port that's next to it is not a USB 4 and it's not a Thunderbolt port. Instead, this is a USB 3 Gen 2 by 2 port. And so it's a little bit faster than our Type-A port, but on the other hand, it's not labeled anything different differently than the high speed middle port. And I just don't know why ASRock rack, if they're going to go and silk screen this thing anyway, and go print some stuff on here, like why not go and make that distinction? Cause who the heck is going to remember that in a year? And it is fair to say that it has display port output, but that's only display port 1.4. And so there's a huge gap between the two type C ports, the middle port and the side port. The lack of good labeling here just drives me absolutely nuts. Should also point out that on the front, there's a combo audio jack. Okay, now looking around the chassis, the top of it is kind of just a blank top, the sides of it, you know, you have some vents, but the real action happens at the back of the chassis, and that is where we're going next. Okay, now on the back of this, you're gonna see that there's a DC barrel jack input, and I'm gonna show you the size of the power adapter compared to the size of the unit. You're gonna see that this is a 120 watt, it's a pretty nice Ockbell unit, but on the other hand, it's, um, it's also huge compared to the system. Okay, and moving on, next to this, we have two USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports. That means that this system has a wild total of five USB ports. That's something else I wish that these could do a little bit better on. It's just having a little bit more USB connectivity. Five ports just kind of feels like, well, I want more. Now, next to the USB ports, we have two HDMI 2.1 ports. And so overall, we actually get four display outputs on this little tiny system, which is pretty awesome. But it's also kind of weird that you have four display outputs and five USB ports. But if you use your four display outputs, you don't really have all, you know, four of or five of your USB ports to go plug stuff in. Okay, now the last big feature we're going to look at on the back of this unit is that this has two two and a half gig Ethernet ports. They're both Intel based. And on port number one, we have an Intel I226LM port, which means that that port is able to be 
used for management. This little system does have vPro, so you can go in and you know do your MEBX and all that kind of stuff and go set up vPro if you want. And you can use this NIC to do that out of band management. I know a lot of folks are gonna look at this and say like, hey, could I make this into like a little server? And if you wanted to do that, maybe vPro is the answer. Now next to that is another Intel i226, but this is just a standard Intel i226V. It is not an LM port. And that brings me to a really important point. I think a lot of these are gonna be running Windows and we ran both Windows and Ubuntu and Proxmox on this. So we've tried a number of different, both Windows and Linux operating systems. At the same time, uh, the fact that you have two NIC ports doesn't mean that you're limited to a two and a half gig ethernet connection unless you go out and like, you know, do LACP or something like that anymore. The big reason that a lot of the NAS vendors and other folks have been adopting SMB3 multi-channel is because it makes life so easy. You could literally have an unmanaged switch plug these two two and a half gig ethernet ports in and now you're running at what is basically a five gigabit connection to things like your NAS storage. And so personally, and I know a lot of folks out there really would want something like a 10 gig NIC in here. And I get that. But on the other hand, nowadays, if you have two, two and a half gig NICs, it's actually not too bad. And it's also a big difference between this and some of the AMD based ASRock industrial systems that we've looked at. Some of the ASRock ones, they will have things like Realtek NICs or they'll have a NIC that's a one gig NIC to be able to do management off of that. And it just kind of is a bummer that they have have, you know, a two and a half and a one gig instead of two, two and a half gig NICs because it just gives you a little bit more bandwidth in the same footprint. With that, I think it's time to get inside the system. Okay, so getting inside the system is super easy. There are four screws that are on the bottom and one bummer is that they are, well, although they're long screws, they're not captive screws. So like if I were to tip this over, the four screws would just go plop out. But the nice thing is that they are in the feet and you don't have to like remove some of the feet on the bottom to be able to get to the screws. There are a lot of mini PCs where that's the case. And so I do like this design, but uh, let's talk about this thing just for a sec, because there's a lot going on just in this bottom cover. The first thing you're going to notice is that we have an array here of different thermal pads. Now these different thermal pads, you have to go peel off the blue plastic, which you see that we've done. And what they do is they cool all of the components or some of the big components in the bottom of the system. So for for example, the top one here that does our M.2 2280 storage, we have a 2242 cooler, and then we also have a two little bits or two little pads for our DDR5 memory. Frankly, I really like this design because it does cool the components better than if they just were sitting in there all by themselves cooking. There is no fan on the bottom of the system, which is kind of a bummer, especially with the fast PCI Gen 4 SSDs and high-speed memory. This bottom though has one more hidden feature that I'm not sure if I love or not. So there is room here to go and put a two and a half inch Realistically, you're gonna put an SSD in here. And then uh, they come with, it comes with this like little tiny SATA cable, SATA data and power cable. You plug it in there with the drive and then you plug this into the motherboard and that's how you put a SATA two and a half inch SSD. And the reason I'm not like kind of crazy about this is that if you put the SSD in here, you have the heat sinks for your other SSDs and your memory and stuff that basically go directly into that same area and piece of metal. And it just kind of feels like that's too much heat getting concentrated on here and there's no fan. So it just kind of feels like, um, I don't know, it just doesn't feel like a good idea. Although overall, this is a pretty low power system, which we'll get to in a little bit. Okay, now moment of truth here. Let's look inside the system and you're gonna see that we have a couple of features here. This is the bare bones configuration right now. Inside, we have an Intel AX211 Wi-Fi module, which is a Wi-Fi 6E module. I kind of feel like this should be a Wi-Fi 7 module at this point. One thing that I did notice, though, is that for whatever reason, in places that we had other systems that performed decently well with Wi-Fi, this one was having trouble just getting onto Wi-Fi networks. And we tried it both here at the studio, I brought it home just to go kind of check at my house, like if it was the same thing. And this one definitely didn't have as good of Wi-Fi performance. And it wasn't the Intel AX211 because we've used that NIC in all these spaces, no problem. So I don't know exactly why, but for some reason, this one had a little bit less Wi-Fi range than some of the other boxes that we had. Now, a couple things with this. So first off, you can put a PCIe Gen 4 by 4 SSD in here and you have the PCIe lanes to go run it. There is a M.2 2242, so 42 millimeter slot right below it. So if you wanted to use the same drives, you can actually do Intel VMD and RAID those drives and have like RAID 1 storage. Okay, and then on the bottom here, we get DDR5 SODIMM slots. Now you might ask, well, what can we do DDR5 SODIMM wise? And uh, you're not limited to DDR5 4800 anymore. You can go all the way up to DDR5 5600. Now for most of our testing, frankly, we use these little crucial mods 
modules, which are 16 gigabytes each. We also used two 48 gig modules, but frankly, we just don't have as many of those. So it's easier just to use 16 gigs where we can just kind of do a lot of our testing with that. Still, this does support 48 gig SO DIMMs. So you can get all the way up to 96 gigabytes of DDR5 5600 memory in this little tiny system. Now, the reason that you might want to go put 96 gigabytes of memory is that the processor that's in here is really fast. It has an Intel Core Ultra 7 series processor, which is the 155H. If you want to look up more about the architecture, you can look up Meteor Lake H, and that'll get you to a lot of the information online about this processor. Okay, so let's talk about the performance of this real quick. And we're gonna do something that's uh, a little bit different than we normally do. So the first thing I wanna talk about is just the general CPU performance, or maybe what's more important is really Meteor Lake. Now, Meteor Lake is really Intel's vision of taking a whole bunch of pieces of silicon and throwing them together, or combining them gracefully into a CPU that has both high power cores or performance cores, as well as E cores, but also have a whole bunch of different functionality in terms of GPU and NPU and all kinds of stuff like that. The reason I wanna bring this up is I'm gonna show you two images here. So first one, I wanna show you the topology of the system. And you're gonna see the normal kind of E cores and P cores, but then also there are like these little E cores sitting off by themselves. And when we go and we do the latency or core to core latency, you can see the two cores that are in their own little world over there in their low power enclave or whatever you wanna call that. And the challenge there is just that they have a higher latency to get to all the other cores that are in this complex. So I do wanna point that out because if you are using all the cores, well, those are gonna be a little bit different, although you do get performance. So when we scale out to do our normal testing where we test the performance of all the cores, we see that we get decent results, basically what you would expect of a Core i7. Meteor Lake H is using DDR5 5600 memory, so you get decent amount of bandwidth and I wouldn't say that, you know, it's necessarily like, you know, this is not like a 2x performance over previous generations, but it is a pretty decent upgrade. Now, there are a couple other things I wanted to try. And the first one is really around the NPU because that's kind of new in this generation. So let's go take a look at that on the other set. Okay, so let's go do something fun. Now, on the screen behind me, you're going to probably see other me with a bounding box on my face. And the reason for that is that we have this camera over here, which is a Sony camera, and that is connected directly to the ASRock box over here. Now what we've done is we've used the ASRock AI Guru software which packages up OpenVINO and a whole bunch of AI uh, kind of demo applications which is actually kind of nice if you just want to get started with that. And what we've done is uh, we're really showing a demo here of inference running on the GPU just doing the bounding box for face detection. So what you're going to see here is that our CPU is running in that you know 20-ish percent range the GPU should be running in that 70% range. And by the way, I should mention that at the same time that we're doing this, we are recording the screen via OBS. But let's look at what happens when we turn on the NPU. So I went back and I swapped this over from the GPU to the NPU, and we're doing face detection. And what you can see is that the NPU is certainly working here. You can see that my face is being bound, kind of similar to how it would be on a camera. And what you're gonna notice is that from a performance perspective, the NPU is running at about 50%. Now we still are capturing the video using the AV1 encoder on the GPU, but we're not using the GPU to go and do this inference. Our CPU utilization, by the way, is only 20 something percent while capturing a 4K video and also doing this AI inference. Now, something that you might notice between the NPU and the GPU is that the performance and the latency is actually a little bit slower, believe it or not, on the NPU usually. And that's okay. I think that that's kind of the point is that, you know, sometimes one option is better. But on the other hand, if you are using those resources that, you know, are on the NPU instead of using GPU resources, well, that's a win because you can use your GPU for something else. Now, one other thing on the GPU side I want to get to is just the performance in gaming because I know a lot of folks care about that. And we don't really do a lot of gaming benchmarks, but I just fired up League of Legends and I started playing it at 4K and I was playing against bots, but it was actually a decent experience, somewhere between 60 and 100 FPS for my entire gaming experience. And honestly, this was very playable at 4K. With that though, let's get to the other set real quick and talk about the power consumption and also the noise. 
Okay, so let's talk about the power consumption of this little unit really quickly. So first off, when you're idle, the power consumption is not too bad at all. The package power consumption is maybe just a little over seven watts. We see the system power consumption at around eight watts or so. And then the noise of the system, it's definitely not a silent system. Like even just standing here a little over a meter away, I can still hear it. But in our 34 dBA noise floor studio, it's about 36, 37 dBA. So it's definitely not too, too bad. But it's also, if you're looking for a silent system, this is not the right one for you. But at least to me, one of the more interesting things about the system is what happens when you put it under load. So what you're gonna see is that we are gonna hit the stress thing here. And when we put stress NG on this thing, start running, you're gonna see that the very, very briefly, we are gonna get red in terms of our CPU core temps. The overall package power consumption is gonna go over 60 watts. The system power consumption is gonna go well into like, you know, the 70 watt range and stuff like that. And then what you're gonna see is that very quickly, this thing has come back down. So what you have to remember on all of these modern systems is that you do get a burst of performance, but then the power consumption comes back down. And so it's kind of really meant for like, you know, if you're doing something really fast, you get that burst of power and then it comes back down to a steady state. Now when we hit this steady state mode with the package at about 28 watts, what you'll see is that the overall system power consumption is maybe in that 36 to 38 watt range. And and also our noise and our just kind of, you know, I can hear it a little bit louder, but it's not too bad. We're somewhere in that like maybe 38 dBA range. Now, a couple things I want to note. First off, uh, you're going to see that this thing has been going now for about two and a half minutes and it is still running in that exact same range. So one of the interesting things with the system is that, you know, you do get that little burst, but then it just kind of runs solid at that 100% range. So it's definitely not one of those systems that like, you know, you see another like drop off on. We've run this thing for hours and, you know, you, you get the same result. So that's fine. The second thing I want to point out is that you can actually go in the BIOS and go tune a lot of this stuff. So if you want a little bit more power consumption, a little bit less power consumption, you want to change some of the behavior of all this stuff, you can do that. We're just using it at its default state because I think most people, that's they pretty much take it out of the box. They install an OS on it and then say, here you go. The other thing I just want to point out is that a lot of people will take these and mount these in very inconspicuous places, whether that's behind a monitor, under a desk or something like that. And if you do move this into a different you know, area, you're probably not gonna hear it. With that, it's time to get to our key lessons learned. Okay, now with all of these videos, I love to have key lessons learned because if we're doing all these reviews of these mini PCs, we should always learn a couple things. The first thing I think definitely was that MPU demo and the AI guru software that these guys have. I think there are folks that are gonna wanna go and do NPU or AI inferencing uh, applications and start doing that development today. And if you do want to do that development today and use the NPUs, well, you're probably going to need to go get a box for that. And something like this is a great little development box. Let's face it. Of course, you can expect that in the future, you're going to have more performance. But on the other hand, at least you can use the NPU today and you can use the NPU along with the GPU. But I think our other key lesson learned is what happens when you put this into performance mode? Because I know a lot of folks online are testing this in that performance mode. And uh, well, let's go over to the other step for that. On the key lessons learned side, something that I definitely noticed is let's just talk about this thing over here and why it's so loud. If you want maximum performance and you can get another, you know, 10 plus percent performance out of this little box, something you can do is you can go and put on the performance mode. Now the performance mode makes the fan go at 100%, just nonstop. You might use this if you're gonna do something like AI inferencing and you just want more performance, but you don't necessarily care about the noise. Now, the other thing with that is that the power consumption goes up quite a bit. So when you look at the idle power consumption, you're gonna see that we've gone from like seven, eight watts-ish to maybe that 13, 14, 15 watt range. So it's almost double the idle power consumption by turning it into performance mode. The other thing though, and you'll probably hear it whenever we have this kind of AI guru set up set on this video, is that this system is now pretty darn loud. I mean, it's actually a little bit distracting. It's running at about 44 dBA, which is significantly higher than we saw when we were running it even at a 100% in just its kind of normal balanced mode. So performance mode, you get more performance, but you're gonna pay for that in terms of power consumption as well as noise. There are a lot of sites that will only test this configuration in the performance mode, but it is so distracting just sitting here that 
I personally would never run the system in performance mode unless I absolutely needed the performance. Otherwise, I would just run it in its balanced, just kind of normal mode because you still get the vast majority of the performance and you don't have to listen to this thing, which is uh, which is definitely distracting just standing about a meter away. Overall, I think that ASRock Industrial did a great job with this system. Now, it's not going to be the fastest system for all of 2024 and into 2025 and all that kind of stuff. And you kind of have to realize the fact that if you get a box this big, there's only so much expansion you're going to get. It's only going to go so fast. I mean, you're not going to have like, you know, a giant 64 core plus processor or anything like that, right? Because it's a system that's this big. On the other hand, I think you do get a lot with this system, especially when you look at all the different types of acceleration, all the different types of cores and all that kind of stuff that you have in a system like this. Just to me, that might be the biggest reason to get a system like this if you're developing on it or you just want access to all the new features that are going to be built on this type of stuff. I think this is a kind of good little box for that. And it's a reason I would get this over an older generation system. And hey guys, I hope you like this video. And if you did like this video, well, why don't you share it with your friends, but also give it a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.